Hi, welcome to ANOVA's Better Breathing with Emphysema, Ask the Expert Lecture. We are streaming live from ANOVA, Medi ANOVA Fairfax Medical Campus in Falls Church, Virginia. My name is Nancy Collar. I'm a respiratory therapist, and I'm the lung navigator here at ANOVA Fairfax Hospital. I coordinate our endobronchial valve program that we're going to be talking about tonight. Tonight, we're talking about COPD and treatment options. Make sure you post your questions in the comment section and we will try to answer them live. Keep in mind, this is for informational purposes only and not intended to replace your physician's advice. We know you also may have questions regarding COVID-19. Please feel free to visit the ANOVA.org slash COVID-19 and cdc.gov slash coronavirus for more information. Joining me tonight is our Medical Director of Interventional Pulmonology at Inova Fairfax Hospital, Dr. Bobby Mahajan. Dr. Mahajan will give a presentation and then we'll have a 30 minute question and answer time. You can download his slides in the handout section on GoToWebinar to follow along. Dr. Mahajan, take it away. Thank you, Nancy. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. So today we're gonna to be talking about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction and how it's changing the paradigm of how we've treated severe emphysema over the last 15 to 20 years. I want to show my disclosures with the Medtronic Corporation and Boston Scientific, which uh, will not be related to this talk. So first of all, I want to give an idea of the overview of emphysema in the first place. Really what we understand for emphysema is known as chronic obstruction, obstructive pulmonary diseases. Is really a progressive airflow limitation that isn't fully reversible like asthma, meaning that the airways can get narrowed and diseased over time. It usually focuses on the smaller airways, and the most common cause associated with emphysema is cigarette smoking. Inflammation within the lungs results from chronic uh, smoking of cigarettes, and as a result, we get injury to both the air sacs of the lung and the small airways. This picture is representative of what we typically see in emphysema upper lobe predominant disease with destruction of the lung resulting in um, air uh, trapping and flattening of the diaphragm. If we look at the prevalence of emphysema, it's very common. Really, if we look at the number of cases throughout the country, there are of millions of cases throughout the year. Really, we see that over the age of 18, we see more and more states running into the situation of having patients with severe emphysema and more shortness of breath related to this. Because of the prevalence of this disease, there are significant amounts of morbidity and also um, decreased functionality and quality of life because of shortness of breath related to this disease. Additionally, the mortality associated with emphysema is, is bad. Although it is improving, it's mostly secondary to the fact that we have better treatments, but people continue to smoke. And as a result, there's an increased risk of disease, not only from the emphysema itself, but there's always an increase of risk with cancers associated with emphysema and smoking. But where have all these things occurred and where have we gotten the idea of smoking and having more involvement with uh, tobacco? Really, it's been available and part of our culture for a number of years. Frankly, before we even knew that cigarettes were that harmful for us with the resulting results in emphysema and lung cancer, some doctors were even saying that it was okay to smoke. It wasn't that long since we've been smoking on airplanes since we were smoking in restaurants. And only now we're starting to see the effects of that as the baby boom generation is getting older and we're seeing more emphysema and lung cancer associated with it. What is emphysema? If we look at healthy lungs, the tissue within the lungs have a very large surface area and they're made out of small airways and air sacs. And those air sacs are able to take in oxygen and transfer it into the bloodstream in the body. They're very elastic, meaning the lungs are like a rubber band, meaning that when they are inflated, they're able to easily contract and actually deflate very quickly to push air out. Unfortunately, with emphysema, there's destruction to these air sacs, the small airways, and as a result, there's impaired movement of gas. And as a result, there's significant trapping of air. And as a result, that results in uh, poor functionality of the actual breathing muscles like the diaphragm. This is a small cartoon looking at normal breathing. At inhalation, our diaphragm will contract. It will move down and therefore result in negative pressure within our chest. Because that pressure in the chest is lower than that in the atmosphere, air rushes into our lungs. When our diaphragm relaxes and pushes up, and also the elasticity of the lungs makes the lungs even smaller, it pushes air out. So that elastic component of the lungs is essential 
for getting all the air out that's taken in. This is a single lung model when we try and explain how movement of gas is affected by emphysema. As you see on the left, there's a small airway, a small air tubule, and on the right is representative of a small air sac. When we take a breath in during inspiration, what we end up seeing contraction of the diaphragm, drop of pressure within the chest, and air moves in. When we expire, essentially our diaphragm relaxes, pushes up, and our elasticity of our lung allow the lungs to get smaller and push air out. This is how normal lungs function. Unfortunately, when there's emphysema in the lungs, we end up seeing bigger lungs than we want. Now sometimes bigger is better. In this situation, it makes your breathing and your functionality of your, your lung muscles, uh, lung and breathing muscles worse. If you see on the left, we end up seeing normal lungs with a nice curved bell-shaped diaphragm. On the right, this is a lung, these are lungs that have been injured by emphysema and flattening of their diaphragms. As a result of flattening of the diaphragms, it, the diaphragm does not function at optimal levels and is not able to push all the air out of the lungs, resulting in gas trapping. And this hyperinflation and gas trapping is the most common reason for having shortness of breath with emphysema. It has nothing to do significantly with the actual oxygen levels. It's more so how you're able to breathe. While you're on the, um, on the WebEx, if you take a deep breath in, hold your breath, and then try and take another breath in, and the difficulty you feel is how emphysema patients feel on a regular basis. This is another picture looking at normal lungs, which have a nice curved diaphragm, versus a more emphysematous lung on the right, which the diaphragm is flattened. As a result, in order to actually breathe and move air in and out, patients are required to use their chest muscles, their neck muscles, in addition to their diaphragm, which they're not used to using. As a result, you end up feeling like you're at the gym 24 hours a day trying to breathe on a regular basis. This is, again, another reflection of how we can have shortness of breath with emphysema on a single airway and lung model. So as you see, on the right, we have the, the air sac, and on the left, we have the small airway. So during inspiration with emphysema, we contract our diaphragm, not as well as we had before, and use our chest muscles, extra work, to actually bring air in. Just like in inspiration, on expiration, we end up trying to relax our diaphragm, but as we push air out, what ends up happening is because those airways, those small airways are injured, they become floppy and prevent air from moving completely out of the, the lung. Based on this, because there's more resistance to blow air out, what we end up seeing is build up a pressure within the, the chest and the lungs. Because of that, when there's a higher pressure to bring more air in, you have to work harder. And as a result, patients with emphysema are working harder every single day, all the time, just trying to get air in. Okay? So that's where we're dealing with on a regular basis, using all our energy to breathe instead of the normal things we want to do, like go for a walk, spend time with our, our family and doing normal exercises. Unfortunately, what we see is that because of this hyperinflation, shortness of breath gets worse, people start acting uh, differently and have decreased activity, they're not exercising as much, they further decrease their activity because now they're deconditioned, further deconditioning then results in an increased uh, risk of mortality due to the complications that come with a sedentary lifestyle. We have good data showing that, frankly, if you have more hyperinflation, on the, looking at the graph on the left, your outcome is worse. You have a higher mortality with the more hyperinflation because you are more prone to diseases and you have less energy to, uh, to uh, devote to the other uh, organs of your body. But what we do see even more so is there's a worse quality of life for people who have, who have excessive hyperinflation. They have more dyspnea, they have less exercise capabilities, they have a lower BMI and poor strength, and they have reduced cardiac and circulatory function. So just because your lungs aren't functioning, you run into a lot of other issues related to the rest of your body. Current treatment options for emphysema, a number of people watching this WebEx are very familiar with these. Some of these include drugs such as inhaled bronchodilators and steroids, both of which can improve your, uh, your breathing, but steroids especially can have a lot of um, complications and side effects that are uh, unbecoming to patients who are already feeling sick. Smoking cessation, any time to quit smoking is the right time. Pulmonary rehabilitation is one of the few things that really improves outcomes and mortality, mainly because we're strengthening those muscles we require to breathe. 
the, the exercises that people are, do are not doing not only to improve their breathing, but to strengthen the chest muscles, the neck muscles, and being able to use different exercises to improve hyperinflation. Oxygen therapy improves the oxygenation throughout the blood and, again, m provides more oxygen to different organs. Lung volume reduction surgery, which is the ability to remove parts of the lungs, the, usually the more upper parts and the diseased parts of the lung. Unfortunately, since patients are already deconditioned and sick with emphysema, there's a high risk in mortality and morbidity associated with doing lung volume reduction surgery. And then finally, lung transplantation. When patients are so sick from uh, emphysema that they require a lung transplant, there's a, it's the last option. In a lot of ways, you're exchanging a lung transplant uh, for, you're exchanging emphysema for the disease of having a lung transplant. So frankly, there's different ways of approaching this, but in general, we've had very few ways of approaching that that's minimally invasive that improves patients' quality of life. We do have some data looking from lung volume reduction surgery meaning that when they used to do these surgeries, we did find that patients were more effective and more functional. But that was in a very small group of individuals. We saw a survival advantage in patients who had mostly upper lobe predominant disease, meaning that most of their destruction was in the upper part of their lungs, and they were not very functional. The problem we ran into with doing these kind of studies is that there was a lot of morbidity and many complications associated with this. There weren't many patients who fell into the, the category of being able to get this kind of surgery. There required a large surgery, meaning a large incision in the middle of the chest. The mortality or death rate at 90 days was 7.9%, which is very high for an elective surgical procedure. And then we had a lot of complications. There was poor healing of the actual uh, sites of, of surgery. Pneumonia was a high incidence. Some patients required to be on uh, the ventilator. Some patients had to be re-hospitalized or had to go back to the operating room for fixing the surgery. So what, were, what was our hope? We had hoped that we would eventually get to the point where we would have a less invasive approach to doing lung volume reduction surgery through minimally invasive tests and treatments like endobronchial valves. And endobronchial valves are essentially small valves that can be placed into the airway and result in collapsing of a part of the lung, deflation, and allowing the hyperinflation to get better. As a result, your actual diaphragm reconforms to be less flattened and more curved and functions better. As a result, people's ability to breathe and their functionality is much better. Unfortunately, a number of studies had come through over the last 10 years attempting to uh, get approval from the FDA for endobronchial valves. Unfortunately, there was not much success. Until recently, we had Zephyr valves approved for endobronchial reduction. And really what we end up seeing for these small valves that are about the size of your fingertips is that they can minimally invasively be placed using a bronchoscope, which is a long camera that we place down into the airways without any incisions or um, uh, cutting in order to uh, place these valves. If we look at this small cartoon, starting at the top, we're able to measure the different sizes of the airways, deploy these valves with minimal uh, risk to the patient, and essentially determine what, what parts of the airways can be treated effectively. By placing these one-way valves, the airway is blocked, the lung itself that is, that is attached to that airway deflates, and as a result, hyperinflation gets better, and the lung and diaphragm are more functional. What we see with these kind of placement of valves is not necessarily a change in the oxygenation of patients, but more so their functionality, which is really what we're looking for um, in terms of improving quality of life. This is a video when we look at placement of a valve. This is the lung, and as you can see, one of those target airways. There's one valve that's already been placed in the airway. This is done through a catheter. So we had advanced the catheter into the airway we measure the distance it has to be placed and deploy the valve. Deployment of the valve is relatively simple when trained appropriately and as a result the procedure itself takes only about 30 minutes total. So a little bit of information about the technology itself Again, it's an implantable device that can include an airway that is, one, is a one-way valve. 
The goal is to occlude the most diseased airways, allowing deflation of that airway uh, and having very few uh, risks associated with it. Frankly, these valves have been used in Europe for some time, and finally we have the uh, ability to do them in the United States. These valves can be permanent, meaning the goal is to leave them in, but if for some reason they're not tolerated, they can be removed very easily, again, as an outpatient procedure um, without any cutting or incisions. The air that is trapped when the lungs distal to where the, le- the valves are placed are able to uh, be decreased and move out through a, a duckbill uh, vent uh, that's l- located within the valves. And again, this allows these, val- these, these lows to be much more functional. These are three of the sizes of the valves being shown. There's actually one more size, a 5.5, a 5.5 low profile, meaning it's a shorter valve. Um, a 4.0 and a 4.0 low profile. Again, this has moved our practice incredibly forward in the sense that we have different sizes, different lengths in order to fit to the the airways exactly as are needed. So getting to this point um, has been challenging uh, over the last 10 years because not so much has it been an issue that they weren't effective, but we have to meet certain uh, endpoints for the FDA to obviously make sure and clear them for use and to be safe. And really what we learned through all of this the last 10 years and the number of trials has really made us better at choosing patients who are going to be effective um, in getting this therapy and also allow them to be, get the most benefit. Over the time, we've been putting valves into patients looking at the surgical literature, saying that, well, it's best to do it the same way the surgeons did. Well, really what we found out, it's much more complicated. Overall, what we wanted to be able to determine was if a lung itself was diseased enough and also to ensure that there was no collateral ventilation. I'll take a step back and discuss a little bit of the anatomy of the lung. On the right lung, there are three lobes, the right upper lobe, the right middle lobe, and the right lower lobe. On the left lung, there are two lobes, the left upper lobe and lingula, which is combined, and a left lower lobe. Between each lobe, we, uh, we would hope there would be distinct what we call fissures or separations in the lobe, meaning that an airway going into the right upper lobe is completely independent of an airway going into the right middle lobe. Unfortunately, what we end up seeing is with emphysema and dilation of those lungs, small communications can open up between lobes. So, for example, in an emphysematous patient, someone may have a communication with their right upper lobe and their right middle lobe. As a result, if we occlude the right upper lobe with valves, they may be able to still inflate that lung through air passing through the middle lobe. And as a result, we wouldn't get the deflation that we were hoping for. Over the last 10 to 20 years, what we've been able to identify is that through the Liberate study especially, which was occurred last year or two years ago, was to identify lungs that were the most diseased that also had no collateral ventilation. And we were able to do this not only by analysis on CT scans, but also in real-time identification through the Chartist exam, which I'll describe shortly. So again, a number of, of trials were looking into this, but most importantly, what we saw is we needed to find patients without collateral ventilation because collateral ventilation really decreased the effectiveness, and we found that patients who had no collateral ventilation had the most improvement and the most success in terms of quality of life and functionality. This is a small, uh, a small cartoon showing an idea of collateral ventilation. On the left, you see this is an example of someone who does have collateral ventilation, meaning there is passage of, of gas between the left upper and the left lower, versus on the right, someone who has no collateral ventilation meaning that there is the, the airways are separated and there's no communication between the two lobes. Again, this is what we saw for our most recent and pivotal trial, the LIBERATE trial, meaning that this is what showed us that patients who had significant disease and did not have any signs of collateral ventilation did the best with regards to um, valve placement. What we saw was there was an improvement in health status measured by the Bode index, improvement in in quality of life and exercise, reduced breathlessness, improved lung function, reduced gas trapping, and again, successful occlusion of those lobes. So really, we do know in large studies that patients did better if they met the correct uh, requirements and were able to get valves. What we looked at in terms of the study, we're again, looking at the basic uh, 
baseline of these patients, but really what this shows is that patients were sick. They were smokers. They had poor um, pulmonary function tests. They had poor oxygenation. And finally, they didn't walk very far with six-minute walks. And again, not to go through too much information, really what I wanted to show you on the left shows improvement in numbers. We see that the actual vo the volumes that we see with their breathing percentages improved with valves. Even more so, comparing to people who got valves, who didn't got va get valves, patients in blue who received valves did better in every possible uh, measure that we looked at. And finally, more importantly, is are these safe? The most important thing we want to provide patients is an option for treatment that provides minimally invasive approaches but is also safe for them. And what we did end up seeing is that there were two things we worried about most with valve placement. One is with pneumothorax. Essentially what we end up seeing is a pneumothorax is a collapse of a lung due to sometimes a small defect in the lung, meaning that if the lung is overinflated, it can pop. When we see that, it's very common uh, to patients require a chest tube for that. When patients have valves, sometimes with the change in a flow of air into a diseased lung, there can be a pneumothorax, which we quickly are able to fix with a chest tube. But again, we wouldn't want to do anything else than we have to. The second thing we, kind of, we see is that sometimes patients have exacerbations or emphysema. When we're doing valves or manipulating the airway, there's always a chance that inflammation can make the, their breathing worse for a short amount of time. So what, is, what implications do we have with this? The implications we have is that it affects how we take care of our patients after valves. For CMS approval to make sure that we were doing these things correctly is that every time a patient gets a valve for emphysema through the Zephyr system, we keep them in the hospital for three days. And the reason for that, looking at the risk of pneumothorax, is the most common time to see it in the first 72 hours. So as a result, when we place valves, we keep patients in the hospital for three days. The hope is that they're sitting there doing nothing and getting bored. But that way we can ensure that they're being observed closely and the risk of pneumothorax is low as, as possible. And when we assess someone for endobronchial valves, there's five steps. One is clinical workup, a stratix analysis where you ana analyze the destruction of the lung and the fissure integrity, a chartist which confirms the fact that they do not have any collateral ventilation just prior to valve placement during a bronchoscopy, placement of the valves, and then post-procedure management. How do we work these patients up? This is really Nancy's forte. Looking at the diagnosis of COPD, making sure they're non-smokers or they've quit um, in, within four months or over four months, a decrease in FEV1, which is essentially a function of breathing, and their breathlessness uh, despite optimal medical management. Again, these are some of the things we look at. One thing we, we really focus on is the residual volume or the, num the amount of air that's left over in your lung after you've finished breathing or done a full expiration. The more air you have left in your lungs is a representation of the residual volume. So a residual volume of greater than 150 is really what we look for, mainly because we know that patients who are going to get valves, if they have trapping of air of greater than 150 will have the best benefits. This is an example of a patient we're looking at who is a candidate for valves. So again, you see a male, uh, a BMI of 19.3, a history of smoking, and frankly, looking at the amount of residual volume. So well over two, 150, actually in the 217 range. This is an example of the Stratix, where it actually looks at the amount of lung destruction and the fissure integrity. So again, we try and take a very scientific and objective approach to deciding who gets valves to improve their outcomes. This is an example of the Chartist system where we actually look at this, their assessment of fissure integrity during the bronchoscopy. And this is an example of looking at if a patient who has fissure integrity or, or lack of fissures, um, if their lung is deflating appropriately when we occlude that airway. But this, again, is a way to make sure that we're getting patients and treating patients who are, most, who are most beneficial for this type of treatment. If we look at pre-treatment versus post-treatment, this is an example of our patient that on the left, you can see very hyperinflated lungs. And on your right side of the left picture, you can see their diaphragm is very flat. After valve placement onto that left side, 
you see that on the right picture, the, val the diaphragm is much more curved, reflecting improvement of their functionality and improvement of movement of the diaphragm. On that, on that uh, follow-up day, on the first day of, sur of surgery, we keep the patients in bed and we keep a close eye for pneumothorax. The second day, we ambulate them to the bed and keep them in into the bathroom and keep them in a chair. On the second day after surgery, we have them walk 20 laps about around our unit. And then on the third day, we try and get them home. This is an example of our program, again, spearheaded by, by Nancy and really supported by our entire administrative staff in addition to our respiratory therapists and nurses. But again, we've really moved forward in terms of doing these procedures um, over the last six months. Now, if we look at our data, we've seen a number of patients who have collateral ventilation. We've screened a number of patients. And over the last um, seven to eight months, we've done approximately 27 cases for endobronchial valves. Uh, to my knowledge, one of the most in the, in the region. When we look at number of cases per month, we end up seeing again that they're, we're trying to do them on a regular basis, and we try to do them on Mondays. And the reason for that is we keep our patients in the hospital. We're able to evaluate them closely for those three, day, three days, and we don't have to worry about um, the weekend coming up. Is pneumothorax a, co a common thing? We have seen common pneumothorax in the sense that about 50% of patients will get a pneumothorax. The ability to see this is honestly... Patients, this means that the, the lung has actually deflated quite well, but it does reflect on kind of the illness and the, the sick nature of some of these patients. Overall, they're doing great, but I think in, gen in general, over the last few cases, we've come into the 40% range in terms of, doing, of occurring pneumothoraces. Our outcomes have been great, looking at some of the long-term effects. The, no, the FEV1 has improved. The amount of hyperinflation that we look at from residual volume has gone down. And more importantly, we're seeing p patients' functionality improving. Their six-minute walks improving. And frankly, we're seeing that our activity um, and their quality of life is improving as well. We've learned a lot of things in terms of developing these programs, meaning that we look at the, we've learned really how to identify these pneumothoraces and keep an eye on them and, and uh, make different kind of algorithms following the placement of these valves, education and management of our staff on chest tubes, uh, we have made it very algorithmic. We keep all of our patients on the same floor with valves and make sure they're rounded on at the same time. We have a true exercise regimen and walking for our patients after they get the valves. And frankly, our, our hospital, our administration, our re respiratory therapists and physicians and nurses have really committed to this program, making sure that we're able to improve the quality of life of our patients and do this in a, a socially responsible way. I want to give some recognition, uh, obviously, to Nancy, um, who has spearheaded this uh, program, Carmen Moore, uh, who is our NP um, in our interventional pulmonary clinic, um, the in interventional pulmonary team, thoracic surgery team, the nurses on the floor where we keep our patients, the APU, uh, administrative champions, including uh, Jen Jennifer Batista, Aaron Hodgson, Matt Paglia, our pulmonary rehab team who ensures that patients are in rehab prior to, after, and, and are seeing the patients during their procedure. Um, Innova transplant program for patients who are not transplant candidates or trying to stave off transplant, valves are an option. And then the Pulmonics Corporation um, who has really helped us develop this program. This is an example of one, uh, a patient who has done very well. Ms. Shawless had asked us about wanting to have improvement in her functionality. Ms. Shawless really wanted to be able to put her makeup on without getting short of breath. After placement of the valves, she was doing well, um, was able to stay in the hospital for only three days, uh, after which she was uh, discharged and has been doing well, was able to put on her makeup and uh, spend time with her grand uh, grandchildren. This was only 10 days um, after her uh, valve placement occurred uh, in this picture. So again, we've had a number of success stories. Uh, we really felt like we've impacted the, uh, the lives of the uh, patients in our community with emphysema and look forward to continuing to develop our program and grow uh, over the number of years to come. So thank you very much. Now we'll open up the floor for questions. Feel free to submit them in the comment sections. Um, and I do already have a couple questions. So the first one, Dr. Mahajan, is how many patients have you put the valves in so far and how are they all doing? 
Uh, so it's a great question. So let me take a, a step back. Valves have been available for different indications for uh, over 15 years. So we'd been placing valves for what we call air leaks um, in the lung for over 10 years or so. When we've done endobronchial valves for lung volume re uh, reduction, in this case, we've done approximately 27 patients. Mm -hmm. Um, really what we've seen is that our outcomes have been great. Uh, patients have been really committed to the program, really realizing that it is a process as opposed to just putting the valves in and sending them home. So we've had a number of success stories. And honestly, we've had a number of patients who are coming in very sick, we place valves, have sometimes had to go home with chest tubes, uh, but have been able to get those tubes out and have felt great and have had more exercise afterwards. What we've seen is that sometimes patients feel so good afterwards, they stop exercising, uh, which is not what we're looking for. Really what we want to see is that by placing valves, having their outcomes and their functionality better, we want them to be doing even more, exercising even more, and not only getting into shape further, but also spending more time with their family and doing things they really enjoy doing. That's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> when will the research currently being conducted in Boston <laughs> come to ANOVA? So there's a few research programs going on throughout the country, um, ones that we hope to be involved in in the near future. And one of them is to look at uh, completing pe people's fissures, meaning that if someone doesn't have a complete mm -hmm. fissure, um, typically they wouldn't be qualifying for endobronchial valve placement. Some of these options are to actually surgically, through minimum minimally invasive surgical techniques, actually do a surgery to close off the fissures with staples and then place valves. As a result, it's still minimally invasive because they're not going through the big surgery for mm -hmm. lung volume reduction surgery, but what they are getting is quality of life in terms of closing off those um, fissures and then placing valves, which is much less invasive than the lung volume reduction surgery itself. So looking at that, we, the, the Boston group uh, where I trained is currently in the process of developing that, mm -hmm. um, that study, and we hope to be involved in that in the next six months or so. Awesome. And I do have a list of patients that um, didn't qualify for the valves because of the fissures, and I will definitely be calling you yes. once um, we have that, I think it's IRB approval, Correct. you said, is what right. we're waiting on. So next question, does the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction procedure also apply to COPD patients that either have asthma or neither emphysema or asthma? So that, that's a great question. We, you know, there, there, are very, uh, uh, there are very strict criteria in terms of uh, choosing a patient for endobronchial valve reduction. Part of the reason we do that is we want to ensure there's adequate hyperinflation mm -hmm. that if we close off that, that lobe of the lung, hyperinflation decreases and their functionality of their diaphragm improves. So emphysema is the most common cause uh, for uh, mm -hmm. patients to have hyperinflation. And again, because smoking is so predominant in our society now and in the past, we're seeing more patients who have smoking-induced emphysema. But there are a number of patients who have different um, uh, conditions that cause hyperinflation and many uh, similar physiologic changes like COPD, like emphysema that results from smoking, but have never smoked. Mm -hmm. Some of those uh, diseases include alpha-1 and antitrypsin disease, which is a, um, a lack of an actual um, uh, enzyme which causes destruction of the lungs and hyperinflation. So those patients are, are excellent candidates uh, for mm -hmm. lung volume reduction because otherwise they're healthy except for their lungs. Um, there are some other diseases like um, uh, in general, we can see patients who have poor formation of their lungs or dysplasia of their lungs result at birth, resulting in hyperinflation. So there are other diseases states that we can use for lung volume reduction. That being said, asthma and uh, having other diseases is not necessarily a contraindication to mm -hmm. having lung volume reduction. Um, patients who have emphysema and asthma are still candidates. The most important thing is we have to make sure their asthma is under control before taking them for endos uh, endoscopic lung volume reduction. Additionally, asthma itself is not an indication or a treatment uh, for using endobronchial valves. There are other minimally invasive treatments for 
um, uh, asthma, mm -hmm. such as bronchial thermoplasty, which we do offer at ANOVA as well. Uh, but right now, the valve system is not indicated for asthma alone, but is possible for patients who have asthma in addition to emphysema and hyperinflation. And that's something that you can tell on their pulmonary function test, Correct. right? One of the most important parts uh, of making these decisions is really looking to see, do patients have hyperinflation and are functional enough based on their pulmonary function mm -hmm. assessment? Pulmonary functions are essentially, a, in a lot of ways, um, an EKG for your lungs. Now, that's, that's kind of making it a little bit uh, consorted, but really what we end up seeing is that we can tell how your lungs function mm -hmm. based on your breathing tests, how much air is trapped, how much air moves into your lung, and what your oxygenation is. On top of that, we can see your functionality really with a six-minute walk, seeing how much you can walk on a flat surface. Based on the, this information, we have objective ways of saying you would be a good candidate or you would be a poor candidate. But really, getting that pulmonary function test and that CT scan to look for those fissures is really the most important mm -hmm. information we can get to not only to tell if you're a good candidate, but also, in a lot of ways, if you're too well for this. We mm -hmm. don't want to put valves into anyone who's not going to benefit. So as a result, we want to make sure they fit the criteria based on scientific data as opposed to just going off the guidelines. Mm -hmm. And I will add the pulmonary function test that we're looking for is actually the one where, where you're in the body box. So if you've had a breathing test where you've just simply blown into something, that's one of the numbers that we use. But the other two numbers that we're really looking for in the RV, the residual volume that Dr. Mahajan mentioned, is only um, we're only able to obtain that number if you get actually get into that body box. So if you haven't had that done, definitely ask your pulmonologist if you can have that test. All right, so the next question, how do you see if you're a candidate? I should probably say, Nancy, you should answer this question <laughs> because you know better than me. <laughs> well, and also the next question is, what's the referral process? So you are welcome to call me. I'm the, the person on the end of the phone that you'll talk to. My number is 703-776-4712, and that is my direct line. You'll get me. Um, like Dr. Mahajan mentioned in his lecture, the first criteria is a diagnosis of emphysema, and there are a couple exceptions that he just talked about. So as long as that pulmonary function test um, meets the criteria, then we would, if you want to say waive the diagnosis of COPD, but most of our patients are going to have that diagnosis of emphysema or COPD. Um, the next one, like Dr. Mahajan mentioned, is we need you to be nicotine-free. And we say nicotine-free now because it's not just smoke-free with vaping being such a, a rave today. So we need you to be nicotine-free for a minimum of four months. Um, we need you to, uh, like I said, have the pulmonary function test. We'll look at those um, results, specifically the RV. So like Dr. Mahajan mentioned, that number, that value that we're looking at is 150%. So you actually can look at your... Um, results that your doctor gives to you and see if that meets the criteria. And um, then we need to get the CAT scan. And we use that, we actually upload those images from the CAT scan um, to a software called Stratix that analyzes every millimeter slice of your lung tissue and assigns what we call a destruction score. And it assigns, it looks at the, the destruction of the lung tissue and assigns it a percentage from zero to 100. Um, to be a candidate, we need that destruction score to be above 50%. And so um, Dr. Mahajan had shown you an example of one of our Stratix exams. I will have one specifically for you after you have your CAT scan, and we'll review that with you. Um, that, that allows us to um, target that most diseased lobe and um, target, hopefully, those fissures are complete. Remember, he talked about that. That's vital. Um, to the success of this procedure. So we'll do that specifically for you. So again, contact me. Um, it is best if you already have a pulmonologist. Dr. Mahajan does not see um, general um, emphysema patients. He's more of a proceduralist. So if you don't have a pulmonologist and you think that you might be a candidate for this, um, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help connect you with a, a general pulmonologist who will be happy to do um, help with this workup. I think I, one thing I want to mention, it's everything that Nancy has said, but even more so, this is, this is a process uh, in the sense that uh, we want to make sure that patients who were referred for lung volume reduction 
um, are appropriate and will benefit. So as a result, not only is Nancy walking you through the process and organizing um, uh, all the information, but more importantly, um, she has an understanding of what your concerns are, what your fears are, and frankly, uh, what your expectations for the procedure are. In order to make sure that we're doing this uh, the right way, not only do we, you know, Nancy and I just sit around looking at these um, patients. <laughs> Essentially, every month we will have okay. a multidisciplinary meeting involving myself, uh, Nancy, pulmonologists uh, from general pulmonology, from the lung transplant group, nurses, um, and pulmonary rehab uh, respiratory therapists to review each patient that is referred uh, to ensure that there are no concerns and make sure that they're appropriate. So this is one of those situations where um, making sure that we have uh, a consensus that patients would do well when we do these procedures is essential because we don't want to make um, it seem as though that uh, we're not going to do someone mainly because of one number. Mm -hmm. uh, really what we want to make sure is that we've taken, we've taken the whole picture, looked at the patient as a whole, and as a group decided that they're going to benefit from this procedure. Yeah, and one thing I want to add is, like Dr. Mahajan mentioned earlier, um, I like to use the term, this isn't a magic pill. I mean, I wish that we had a magic pill for you, but we don't. This definitely helps. Um, and one of the things that you can start doing even right now is pulmonary rehabilitation. And obviously with the coronavirus um, scare going on, we're not, our, our pulmonary rehabilitation program is closed right now, but you can exercise from home. I know we started doing virtual exercise even today in our pulmonary rehabilitation program. So just get moving. That's really the key is we need those lung muscles. Um, strong, because like Dr. Mahajan mentioned in the talk, you're burning more calories at rest just to breathe than we do. And so the stronger your chest wall muscles and your core muscles can be, the, the easier it's going to be for you to breathe just at baseline. So since I just mentioned coronavirus, there is a question. How has the coronavirus impacted COPD patients? So this is uh, an excellent question. So let me, um, a few things, just take a step back and talk about the coronavirus shortly, is that, you know, the coronavirus is a pandemic we haven't seen the likes of um, in, in the last century. And part of that is because it's a new virus mm -hmm. and we're learning more about it every single day. The issue we run into with the coronavirus is that patients in general, the community is at the same risk for getting it. Um, and that risk is dependent on social distancing, hand hygiene, coming into contact with people who have had it and, and, and travel. But really what the issue is that patients who get it with underlying conditions like mm -hmm. emphysema, like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, um, are unable to tolerate it as well, meaning that their body isn't well enough to mm -hmm. stave it off and fight it off. Um, and as a result, patients become more sick. Um, really, you know, I think that as a, a, a nation and a, and a uh, you know, planet, we're learning more and more about it every day. And we're trying to find the best uh, key to um, keep patients with underlying conditions like emphysema, like heart disease, like cancer, like asthma, safe. And that's where social distancing mm -hmm. and hand hygiene comes in. So what we've seen is that again, we have a number of patients set up for doing this procedure, but we also wanna make sure we're being safe. We wanna make sure that we're taking care of patients and putting them at the lowest risk. Uh, so what we've seen is that patients with underlying conditions are, are scared. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, uh, fear and anxiety is a great motivator um, <laughs> in the sense of being vigilant, um, keeping their hands clean, keeping distances. But what we've seen is that patients who are able to do those things are avoiding the virus. Um, for us, because we are a quaternary medical center and we're seeing some of these patients um, on a regular basis, just like everyone else in the DC region and the, and the, and the country, um, we've been holding off in the short term from doing these procedures. Uh, but as, long, as soon as things are feeling as though they're turning around, uh, it's safe for patients uh, to have these procedures, especially because of the underlying conditions, uh, we'll be moving forward again. Right, that'll be good. So you guys need to stay home, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stay. But keep exercising. Yes. Keep exercising. Wash your hands good. <laughs> All those things that you're hearing on the news are yes. good. So can this treatment be conducted on someone with blood clots? So, yeah. So what I will say is that every patient uh, is, as we review them, mm -hmm. uh, we look at their other medical problems. 
Um, and in general, it depends on what the blood clot is for. Um, if the patient is someone who's on chronic anticoagulation or blood thinners because of a blood clot um, a long time ago, this is definitely an option, meaning that we would hold their uh, anticoagulation for a short amount of time, uh, do the procedure, and then restart their anticoagulation afterwards. Okay. For patients who have just had a blood clot, typically we would want three to four months of anticoagulation before mm -hmm. we start considering stopping it. And again, it depends on why they had the blood clot. If they had a, a provoked blood clot, meaning that they were in an airplane for 10 hours and they got a blood clot, we know that uh, that is not a common occurrence. But patients who have underlying clotting disorders, again, it could be a little bit more tricky. Uh, but is it, is it a, a possibility? It's a definite possibility. But frankly, we need to be able to meet with our patient, get a full history, go through the procedure, and make sure that's safe for them, uh, even if they do have a blood clot. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we've come to the end of our questions. So again, thank you so much for joining us today and sending in your questions. If we didn't get to your question or if you think of something after we've signed off, um, please send them in. We'll post the answers later. And again, you can always call me. I'm happy to, to talk to you and answer your questions. And Dr. Mahajan, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. To learn more about COPD and our bronchoscopic lung volume reduction program, visit anova.org slash breathe, and that is B-R-E-A-T-H-E. And as always, if you need assistance in locating a physician, go to anova.org slash physicians. A survey will be available through GoToWebinar now, and we will be sending out a recording of the lecture next week. Thank you for your participation, and have a great night.